Mysteries interest many of us. The fact that something remains unsolved makes us question it even more. One thing's for sure, there have been a lot of unexplained mysteries over the years. So from mysterious events to cryptids and paranormal encounters, this is a compilation of my favourite mysteries I've covered so far. Nestled in the remains of the ancient city of Tiwanaku, Bolivia is the giant remain site called Pumapuku. Archaeologists believe the site to be the cradle of civilization in South America, predating the Mayans. Evidence found in this region of Bolivia suggests the area was a flourishing center for pre-Columbian culture as early as 600 AD. However, recent discoveries of monolithic structures 15 to 20 meters under the surface of a nearby lake establishes that this civilization may date back as much as 12,000 years earlier. This calculation comes from archaeologist Hugo Barrow Rojo, who calculated the depth of structures means this area of lake was above water level at some time in the past. Sedimentary evidence places that time between 11,700 and 10,800 BC. Pumapunku is one of the world's most mysterious ancient sites. This remains true for both academic archaeologists and historians as well as rogue historians, who investigate the hypothesis of advanced prehistoric civilizations or ancient assistance from extraterrestrials. The mystery lies in the precision and complexity of the structures that pervade the ruin. The finely cut doorways and remaining stone blocks bear no chisel marks, and many interlocked with very fine precision. According to Jason Yeager, a professor of anthropology at the University of Wisconsin, the city was already abandoned when the Incas conquered the area in 1470. The Incas spared no expense, however, incorporating Pumapunku and the rest of the city into their empire and culture. Yeager said the Incas held the fallen stone portraits near Pumapunku to be the models of the first humans of the creation myth. These stone figures, however, are actually thought to depict the city's former rulers. Early explorer Arthur Ponansky, one of the first modern explorers of the site, dated Pumapunku to be about 15,000 BC. Modern archaeologist Neil Steed stands behind his claim. Bosnansky used the astronomical alignments of the site's main temple to date it. Steed said in an interview with Forbidden History, they built the temple itself as a giant clock. On the first day of spring, the sun rises directly above the center of the temple through a stone archway. The sun moves along the horizon as the days of the year pass. Bosnaski expected to find the sunrise above cornerstones on either side of the temple in the summer and winter solstice, but found it rose some distance off. Bolivian archaeologist Dr. Oswald Rivera agrees the temple was built with astronomical alignments. The buildings are deliberately orientated to the cardinal points, but he said the builders made a mistake. That's why the sun doesn't rise over the cornerstones on the solstice. Steed disagrees the meticulous builders would have made such an error. The stones fit together with such precision he couldn't even wedge a needle between them. He said the following, After observing the perfection of which this site is built, to suggest that such things as the solstice markers are misaligned I find incredible. Other features of the site include a complex irrigation system, and smoothly drilled holes and channels in certain stone blocks that seem to defy the stonework of the Incas all known pre-Inca peoples in the region. For this reason, some believe they may have had help from a more advanced civilization. But what do you think? How did this civilization build these structures with such precision? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. The Great Pyramid is a true masterpiece and has rightly earned the title of a wonder. It was built with such precision that our current technology cannot replicate it. There are so many interesting facts about this pyramid that it baffles archaeologists, scientists, astronomers, and tourists. The pyramid is 756 feet long on each side, 481 feet high and composed of 2.3 million stones weighing nearly 3 tons each for a total mass of 6.5 million tons. Legend has it that the structures were erected in just 20 years time, meaning that a block had to be moved into place about every 5 minutes of each day and night. That pace would have required the labor of thousands. At the temple of Hatha Dendera, are stone reliefs showing a large light bulb being used by Egyptians. Also referred to as the Dendera light bulb, the description is similar to the early light bulb known as the Crook's tube. The reliefs version of this light bulb shows a snake inside the glass bulb in the form of a wavy line, 
This is believed to represent the hot filament. Snakes have been used to represent godlike knowledge and wisdom, and are often used to represent rocket ships or spacecrafts that brought ancient aliens from the stars. Considering the lack of technological understanding of the primitive Egyptian craftsmen, it's understandable how they would consider a white hot filament to be a magical snake. The filament originates from a lotus flower. A wire leads from the socket to a small box which Shu, the Egyptian air god, is kneeling. Shu was tasked with cooling and maintaining the air. Beside the bulb stands a two-armed pillar which is connected to the filament. This pillar is believed to be the power source for the light bulb. This pillar looks like an electrical capacitor that we use today in power plants, and it's hard to believe the Egyptians possessed this technology. The presence of electrical lights would explain how the tomb hieroglyphs and inscriptions found under the Temple of Hathor were created without the use of burning torchlight. Torches were used to give light to those that created the reliefs, and hieroglyphs found in many tombs and temples of Egypt. So how did they do their work in darkness? The use of light bulbs answers the question. Some suggest electric light is in fact the only plausible explanation for how light was generated without burning flames in the deep chambers under the Temple of Hathor. In fact, the discovery of the Baghdad battery shows this could have been how the Egyptians powered the light bulb. The Baghdad battery is the common name for a number of artifacts created in Mesopotamia during the Persian Empire period and discovered in 1936 near Baghdad, Iraq. Through the use of copper, electrolytes and salts in a clay jar, electricity was believed to have been generated. In August 1993, 27-year-old Kelly Cahill, her husband and three children were driving home after a visit to her friend's house. Their routine journey would soon become a trip they'd never forget. After midnight, the Cahills were on their journey home when they first noticed the lights of a rounded craft with windows around it. It silently hovered above the road. Different coloured lights were clearly visible in the bottom of the object. The UFO was so close to the ground that Kelly thought she could see people looking through the windows. As she began screaming to her husband what she was seeing, the craft zoomed off to their left disappearing as quickly as it made itself known. Continuing their drive home with an interest in the sky, they suddenly came upon a light that was so bright they were practically blinded. Shading her eyes from the intense lights of her hands, Kelly begged of her husband, What are you going to do? Her husband, now frightened, replied, I'm going to keep driving. Within what seemed only a second or two, Kelly was now very relaxed, suddenly calmed by the disappearance of the intense glowing light. The first words out of Kelly's mouth were, What happened? Did I black out? Her husband said nothing as he had no answer to give his wife. He cautiously drove his family home. Upon their safe arrival, Kelly could smell a foul odour. Like vomit and she suddenly felt as though something was missing from their drive home. An hour or so time had vanished from her and her family's life. That night as Kelly undressed for bed, she noticed a strange triangle mark on her navel, a mark that she had never seen before. Kelly suffered from illness for the next two weeks and was taken to the hospital on two occasions, one for severe stomach pain and the other for a urine infection. Kelly would soon begin to remember details of that fearful night, and without any regressive hypnosis. She recalled the objects they had seen in a slightly different place than she first remembered. It was hovering in a gully and the UFO was big. She estimated the size at 150 feet in diameter. She could also recall that when the object was first spotted, her husband had stopped the car and both her and her husband had gotten out of the vehicle and walked in the direction of the massive craft without fear. It was as if they were being subconsciously drawn to the craft. To their surprise, they noticed another car stopped on the side of the road. As they walked down towards the craft, they saw a creature unlike either of them had ever seen before. It was black. Kelly would later describe it as not having a soul. The black alien entity was taller than the average man, about seven feet tall according to Kelly, and its eyes were large and glowing red. Kelly had a sense that the creatures were evil. She clung to her husband, fighting the feeling of blacking out. Her great fear and dread would cause her to scream at the alien-looking entities to leave them alone. The account of Kelly Cahill has been examined and re-examined by many researchers. Nothing has been proven or disproven. Kelly was considered a reliable, honest person by those who knew her at the time of this strange sighting. Her case is considered legitimate by many UFO investigators. 
The Bridgewater Triangle refers to an area of about 200 square miles within southeastern Massachusetts in the United States. The area has been subject to numerous cryptozoological sightings. Since the 1970s, there have been several reports of tall, hairy, ape-like creatures roaming the swamp. There have also been numerous sightings of thunderbirds, giant pterosaur-like creatures that have been seen fighting in mid-air. In 1976, there was a report of a man who saw a giant red-eyed black dog. It's believed these dogs aren't actually living, even though to the human eye they do look real. The area has a history rife with friction between settlers and the native people who live there. The whole area originally belonged to the local Pogasat tribe, but over the years much of this land was acquired from them, beginning with the 1659 purchase of Freetown which was incorporated as a town in 1683. Over the years more and more of the land was purchased from the tribe, much of it by greedy chiefs without proper consent from the tribe members. During the King Philip War, the Pocasset tribe fought on the side of the English and was rewarded with 190 acres of land in Fall River, Massachusetts, which was at the time known as the Watupa Reservation. However, in 1907, Fall River took 100 acres of this land in order to secure the city's drinking water supply. It was not until 1939 when the state of Massachusetts returned some of the land that had been taken, and the tribe was left with the current Wampanoag Reservation, which covers 227 acres. There have been several reported sightings of a Bigfoot-like creature in the Triangle, usually near the Hockamock Swamp. Joseph de Andrade claimed to have seen a half-man and half a creature entering the woods near the swamp in 1978. Local resident John Baker also reported seeing a large hairy beast in a river in the swamp while canoeing. According to one tale, the Native Americans had cursed the swamp centuries ago because of the poor treatment they received from the colonial settlers. It's believed the humanoid people are witnessing could be the Grassman. The Grassman is a tall bipedal hominid that stalks woodland areas. It's reportedly very similar to Bigfoot. It seems to be much more aggressive than any other Sasquatch species. The Grassman gets its name from the small, hut-like living structures or nests it builds out of grass. So what do you guys think? Is the Bridgewater Triangle really cursed? Let me know your theories in the comments. In the Venice Lagoon between Venice and Nidos is the small island of Pavea. Inhabited since 421, when mainlanders fled to seek refuge from the invaders, Pavea's population began to dwindle centuries later, and in the 14th century the island was completely abandoned. As with many small islands in Europe during the plague outbreak in the 14th century, the island became a quarantine colony. Many locals were sent here to die their infected bodies being burned on giant pits. This was also the case in 1630, when the Black Death swept through Venice. The distance from the mainland meant the sufferers would not only be out of sight and out of mind, but a safe distance away from those who'd yet to contract the plague, the fatal disease that left victims with boils. For those who look carefully, there are still a number of plague pits littered all over the island. Giant graves where people were dumped after death with the hopes of keeping the deeds from spreading to the doctors and nurses. Finding the location of Pavea to be small and easily missed, Napoleon also used the island for a darker purpose, storing weapons there. The location was discovered and many small battles took place as the island claimed even more lives. The site was apparently used as a mental asylum during the 1800s, however many sources state that was simply not the case. Stories persist though of ill treatment and experimental procedures being carried out. During the 1930s, a doctor is believed to have gone crazy and jumped from the bell tower. From the mid-20th century up until 1975 when it was closed, Bavaria Hospital was used as a geriatric centre. Today the whole island is abandoned, and it's believed that many locals dare not step foot on the island for fear of being cursed. Fishermen also refused to fish in the area for fear of dragging up human remains. The ghosts of patients and victims of disease are said to haunt the island and its buildings. Voices and screams are often heard, with EVPs often being captured. Dark fleeting shadows are often witnessed and possessions have been reported. In 2016, 
five people from Colorado were rescued by Italian firefighters after they decided to spend the night on a famous island. They reached the island through a water taxi and decided to stay for the night. But as soon as darkness took over, a presence started to haunt them, making them scream for help. A sailboat in the area overheard them and called the Italian authorities that came to their rescue. The Devil's Tramping Ground is a camping spot situated in a forest in Bear Creek, North Carolina. It has been the subject of many local legends and stories, which frequently allege that the Devil tramps and haunts a barren circle of ground in which nothing is supposed to grow. What's also strange is any vegetation planted there will wither and die. The area also affects animals. Dogs tuck their tails between their legs and whimper when brought near. The frightened animals will dig their heels into the sand refusing to be brought into the circle. There have also been stories of people attempting to spend the night here. However, it is reported that no one has been able to stay here for more than a few hours. Headaches, chest pains and aches have been reported by people that have strayed too close to the area. The story goes that in this tramping ground, the devil spends his nights pacing around in a circle and turning his bitter mind towards ways to bring the human souls to hell. It's the scorching heat of his cloven footprints that kills the vegetation, and has rendered the soil barren. He angrily brushes aside anything left in his path, his great strength easily able to toss aside even the heaviest objects. When he walks in his private spot on earth, the devil drops the illusions with which he disguises himself when he appears to men. In its natural state, the face of this fallen angel is so horrible that no man can see it and remain sane. There may be an explanation for why plants don't grow in this area. Rich Hayes, a soil scientist, has tried to find a non-devil related reason for the lack of plant growth there. He said the following, When I investigated the site over 15 years ago and collected the data, I was theorizing there was some natural cause that would have done it. To find what that natural cause might be, Hayes compared soil from inside the circle to soil from outside. He was looking specifically at the salt and copper content of the soil, as large amounts of either substance will kill plants. What he found out was elevated readings of certain things inside there. The test he carried out raised more questions than it answered. The soil in the circle has a higher sodium, copper, zinc and pH level than the soil from the woods a few yards away. Also, at certain points in the circle, a compass will skew by about 5 degrees. As if that's not strange enough, compasses usually only do that around soils with high iron content, which this soil does not have. Despite all the mysteries, one feature of the Devil's Tramping Ground immediately gave Hayes a few ideas. The ash pile at the centre of the circle. He said that the ashes and charred logs would have some effect on the vegetation capabilities. Although, even with this outcome, the legend of the Devil's Tramping Ground still persists. The Phantom of Crogglin Grange is one of the best known vampire stories in Britain. Legend tells that Crogglin Grange was in the hands of the Fisher family for many centuries. In the early 19th century, the Fishers moved from the property into larger dwellings, and put the property up to let. All during the long cold winter, the house was empty. As the winter passed into spring, the Grange was finally let to two brothers and a sister called the Cranswells. It seems they enjoyed life to the full and soon settled into village routine, and socialised with the local people. They were well liked within the village and loved their new home very much. One summer's evening, Miss Cranswell looked out the window in the direction of the darkened churchyard at the bottom of their long garden, and noticed something peculiar in the vicinity of the churchyard. It seemed that above the darkened blackness of the gravestone, she could see two points of light moving. In time, they moved from the graveyard over the shadows of the wall, moving closer to the bottom of the garden where they played around the churchyard wall. By this time, Miss Cranswell's curiosity had given way to a deep feeling of unease. She shut the window, tight bolted the door, and lay down on her bed to try and get some sleep. On the verge of sleep, she was suddenly jolted awake by the low rustling from outside the window. She twisted in bed and sat upright. Outside the window were two points of light which she recognised as the vampire's eyes. He stepped to the bed and in one movement grabbed her hair with his hands. He then pulled her head back as if to deliver a kiss. The brothers sleeping in separate rooms were aroused by the loud pitched scream that seemed to shake the very walls of the Grange. In a moment they were before their sister's door. 
The door was locked so they smashed through it breaking into the devastating scene. There was a stench of mouldy decay in the air and upon the bed lay their sister, blood pumping from gashes in her neck. One of the brothers rushed to the open window and just caught sight of a shadow flittering across the bottom of their garden near the churchyard. They managed to stop the blood flow and revive Miss Crownswell. The next few hours were spent in an attempt to save her life. Miss Cranswell survived the attack and when she was strong enough to travel they took her to Switzerland to recuperate in the fresh mountain air. When the false story was in the open the brothers swore revenge on the creature. So it came to be that the Cranswells returned to Groglin one dark winter's day. Miss Cranswell took her place in the room overlooking the churchyard and as the moon rose a pair of bright lights shone in the windows of the churchyard. Once more the figure of a man appeared at the window and picked the leaded glass to gain entry to the bedchamber. This time the two brothers were lying in wait in the shadows. As the figure came to step into the room they both released shots of the creature. There was a low howl and the creature sped off at the direction in which it came. Not wishing to follow such a night creature into his domain the two brothers waited for daybreak. First thing in the morning they took Miss Cranswell to safety and gathered all the residents of the Grange around them to carry out their gruesome task. The men searched the graveyard for any signs of disturbance. On finding none they turned their attention to the church. All was quiet but they noticed that the crypt door was slightly ajar. Pushing into the crypt they were met with a chilling scene. All around the crypt were the scattered remains of broken coffins and human bones. One coffin stood alone in the corner and seemed to have been untouched by the chaos. The villagers wrenched off the coffin lid. Inside wrapped in mouldy clothes was what they assumed to be a vampire. Its eyes were cold and lifeless in the daylight, but a fresh pistol wound was gaping from one of the creature's legs. The villagers dragged the coffin and its demonic contents out into the churchyard and burned the lot to ashes. Nobody seemed to know where this strange creature came from, or why it remained dormant in the centuries of peace when the fishers lived in the property. One can only surmise that during the period of dereliction, an age-old horror was reawakened and would not return to rest after the house was reoccupied. Sheep Squatch, also known as the White Thing, is a woolly head cryptid reported across numerous counties in West Virginia, predominantly within the southwestern region of the state. It's described as being a quadruped about the size of a bear, with entirely white wall-like fur. It has a long pointed head similar to a dog with long sabre like teeth and a single point set of horns dissimilar from those found on a young goat. Its forelimbs end in paw like hands similar to those of a raccoon but larger, while its tail is long and hairless like that of a possum. It's reputed to smell like sulphur, which has been attributed through folklore to the beast being born within the TNT area in Mason County like one of the Mothman theories. In 1994, a former Navy seaman stated having witnessed the beast breaking through the forest, after ingesting a mound of shroom caps he found on the forest floor. The white thing breached the brush line and knelt to drink from the creek. Here it drank for a few minutes before crossing the creek and continuing on towards the nearby road. The witness stated they observed the animal for a while before it moved onto the surrounding brush. Within the same year two children observed the creature while playing in their yard. This occurred within Bone County. What they reported seeing looked like a large white bear, yet in this case stood up on its hind legs making it over six feet tall. Startled by the children, the beast ran through the forest breaking medium sized branches in its path. The creature was then spotted a year later, this time involving a car. A couple driving through Bone County observed a large white beast sitting in the ditch alongside the roadway. As many curious passbyers might do in such a situation, they stopped their car to get a better look. They came to describe the creature again as mostly similar to early descriptions, yet they added the creature had four eyes. In stark contrast to the last sighting where Sheep Squatch fled the scene, the creature leaped out the ditch and started to attack the car. Frightened by the attack, the couple drove off quickly, and once they arrived back home noticed large scratches on the side where the beast had attacked. Another incident in 1999 involved a couple of campers who were in the forest at night, again in Bone County. Their encounter occurred around a bonfire. They eventually heard an animal snorting and scuffling around a camp in a manner similar to an aggravated bear, 
though it did not come into the light of the campfire immediately. All of a sudden the Seep Squad suddenly charged out of the darkness of the campers. Reacting quickly they jumped up and ran back to their house, all while being pursued by the Sheep Squatch. The white creature stopped at the edge of the forest where they crossed it, and let out a terrible scream. It then turned around and headed back into the woods. The next morning the campers returned to their campsite and their trail home, finding it to be torn up. In Fox Run, Virginia, the beast was spotted once again. The creature was spotted close to midnight by six campers. The beast was reportedly 8-9 to nine feet tall with a shoulder length of 4-5 to five feet. One of the campers first saw the beast at the top of a nearby hill in a crouching position. Then it stood up and he alerted the other campers. Then it started running down the steep hill towards the campers, but they were separated by a river that was flowing through. They looked in as it searched for a way to cross, and with no other option began to wade through the river. It finally came out of the water and the campers reported that it appeared like a bipedal dog in the chest, with its fur wet from the river crossing. Then a loud screech was heard about two miles off from where they were. The campers quickly packed and left and reported it to the locals, fearing that if the authorities were informed they would be ridiculed. The identity of the campers is unknown as of March 2016. Homo sapiens is part of a group called hominids, which were the earliest human-like creatures. Based on archaeological and anthropological evidence, we think that hominids derived from other primates somewhere between 2.5 and 4 million years ago in eastern and southern Africa. Though there was a degree of diversity among the hominid family, they all shared the trait of bipedalism or the ability to walk upright on two legs. However, there are some that don't believe this. Many people believe that mainstream history is wrong, the alleged 100 million year old fossilized finger is one of those things that should not exist according to mainstream scientists. Numerous discoveries have been made in the last 50 years that suggest mankind has inhabited this planet much before mainstream science tells us. Giant footprints in Africa suggest that different species inhabited our planet around 200 million years ago. It is possible that our planet has gone through different stages of development, where different species dominated the planet. Many people believe that our history has different stages, and that in each stage civilization and society develop differently. Evidence of this unknown history is found across the planet. According to mainstream archaeology and anthropology, the oldest human fossil is around 2.8 million years old. But as mentioned before, there have been many discoveries that challenge this conventional thinking segment. One of those incredible discoveries that breaks up all patterns formed by science is a fossilized human finger that's believed to be 100 million years old. This incredible discovery was made in the 1980s at a quarry from a Cretaceous limestone formation in Texas. According to paleontologists, in order for soft tissue to fossilize like this, the finger must have been rapidly buried in an oxygen-free environment. The discoverer of the fossilized finger was extremely lucky to come across something like this. The mysterious finger was sectioned by scientists and revealed distinctive inner structures which were arranged in concentric circles. Further analysis of the finger revealed the presence of what appeared to be bones, joints and tendons preserved inside the finger. Even though experts cannot attribute to who the finger belonged to, or what species it's very unlikely that it belonged to a primate. The question that remains is how is it possible that a 100 million year old fossilized finger exists? Did some sort of unknown human species live on Earth 100 million years ago? Is it possible that the so-called out-of-place artifacts aren't very much out of place? This photo was captured from the St. Augustine episode of the Travel Channel's Ghost Adventures. It was captured by a tourist. The team from Ghost Adventures were chatting to Cal Hogan who produced this photograph, apparently showing the ghost of Andrew Ransom a ruthless English pirate taken by a visitor. In these ghost photographs, the figure on the left who is not seen by anyone else at the time is wearing the ruffled collar that resembles the period that Ransom was in St. Augustine. This was around the late 1600s. His ghost has been seen numerous times around the Castillo area, by both locals and tourists. Some have gone as far as saying they physically felt his presence. This includes mysterious voices, unexplained footsteps and cold spots. 
on the morning of September the 16th, 1994. Teachers and school officials of the aerial school in Rawa, Zimbabwe were amazed when the school students, aged approximately 5 to 12 years old, had reported that a flying object had landed on the school grounds. The teachers at the school were in a meeting, so the 62 children were unsupervised while in the schoolyard on morning recess. The only available adult seems to have been one of the mothers, who was operating the school tuck shop, a sort of snack bar where candy snacks and sodas are sold. According to some sources, UFOs had been seen in the skies over Zimbabwe for two days before the incident occurred. Rawa is around 20 kilometers from the capital of Zimbabwe, and Aerial School is a private elementary school. The children said that they'd first seen three objects in the sky. These objects would disappear and then reappear in different locations. The objects moved closer and closer to the ground and finally landed in a brushy area adjacent to the schoolyard. This area had not been fully cleared and was off limits to the students. The object landed or hovered just above the ground in an area around 100 meters from the students. The children said that a small man about one meter in height appeared on the top of the object. The little man, who was described as having a scrawny neck, long black hair and huge eyes, walked a short way across the ground towards the students. When he noticed the children, he vanished and then reappeared at the back of the object. The object then took off and vanished. The smaller children were very frightened and cried for help. They believed that the little man was a demon who would eat them. African children have heard legends of Tokolosis, demons who come for children. The children ran to the tuck shop operator, but she did not want to leave the shop unattended. The late Cynthia Hind, known as Africa's foremost UFO investigator, investigated the cause the next day. When she was first contacted, she asked the headmaster of the school, Colin Mackey, to have the children draw pictures of what they saw. When she arrived at the school, he had around 35 drawings for her. The drawings were of very similar objects. The headmaster affirmed that he believed the students were telling the truth, and one little girl said the following, I swear by every hair on my head and the whole Bible that I'm telling the truth. Dr. John Mack, the abduction researcher and his associates, went to Roa and spent two days interviewing and counselling 12 of the children and their parents. Curiously, the older students said they felt that the creatures were communicating with them somehow, sending the message that we humans are destroying our planet, and polluting the environment in ways that will have dire consequences. One person said those thoughts came from the man's eyes. The Sightings TV show did a report on the aerial score landing, and video footage exists of actual testimony from the children. So my question to you guys is, what do you think these children saw? Let me know your theories in the comments. Kawak is a cryptid native to the Indonesian island of Nusa Kamabangan. It's reported as a reptilian creature, bipedal in stance and known to attack humans. Locals knew the Kawaks as vicious corpse eaters, the locals said that Kawak has the shape of a monitor lizard are carnivorous and has four limbs. Their sense of smell is very strong just like the Komodo dragon, but the difference from these two creatures is that the Kawak stands, and widely attacks humans on sight. They usually exhibit pack hunting traits and are usually seen when darkness falls. Because of this, locals on the island don't want to store any food in their home. As reported by Madurka News in 2014, Harry, a fisherman and guard on the island, saw the creature with his friends. A pack of Kawaks was tracking him. Reported sightings like these are rare because not many media agencies come to the island. Movement of people in and out of the island are also controlled by authorities. The island is very isolated. It only has around 3,000 residents, making it sparsely populated. Nasa Kambanga is also dubbed the Indonesian Alcatraz because the island is home to one of the country's most guarded prisons. To escape from the prison might mean certain death. This is because the island is mostly jungle and it's also home to many wild animals. The government kept the island as a natural reserve. Electricity in the island is very scarce. Generators have to be turned on when night falls. Village residents usually stay in their home at night. If someone wanted to go out, it's normal to carry a traditional machete as a form of self-defense. So what could this creature be? 
most people think the Kawak is most likely a Komodo dragon. These reptiles can pose a danger towards humans. The average size of a male Komodo dragon is 8 to 9 feet and around 200 pounds, but they can reach up to 11 feet in length. Komodo dragons are carnivorous. They're such fierce hunters they can eat very large prey, such as water buffalo, deer, pigs and even humans. They will also eat smaller dragons. They can eat 80% of their body weight in one feeding. To catch their prey, they use an ambush strategy. Matching well with the dirt surroundings on their island home, they lie in wait for an unsuspecting animal to pass by. They then spring into action landing a venomous bite before the victim can escape. Although some have suggested that the island natives are aware of what a Komodo dragon is, and when asked about the Koak, they describe a dinosaur-like creature. This is the original legend of how the money of Oak Pit Island was discovered. It shouldn't be taken as absolute fact, as many elements of the story have been debated for the past century. In 1795 at age 16, Daniel McGuinness made his way across to Oak Island on a fishing expedition. Once on the island, he found himself stood in a clearing in front of an old oak tree bearing the marks of an unnatural scarring. This he supposed to be caused by a rope and tackle system used to lower material down into a shaft below, indicated by depression beneath the tree about 4.8 meters in diameter. This completed the scene as Daniel immediately recognized it from a childhood tales of pirates. The very next day, Daniel returned to Oak Island accompanied by two friends. Equipped with picks and shovels, they began the task to recover the treasure, but it was to take much more digging equipment than they first anticipated. As the three boys began to dig, they found the earth still bore marks on its smooth clay sides. Their excitement rose when at a depth of 1.2 meters, they hit a layer of flagstones. These were removed only to reveal patched logs at 3 meters, 6 meters, and 9 meter intervals. On removing these layers of logs, the boys realized they were going to need more substantial tools if they were going to recover the treasure of Oak Island. They reluctantly returned to the mainland, making a pledge to return and recover the treasure. Although nine years would pass until Daniel and his friends would return to Oak Island, they found the treasure digging site just as they've left it. Returning with a local businessman, the projects now had financial backing and support from the local labor force. The treasure evacuation had now begun, with everyone wanting a share of the gold if and when they found it. As the treasure seekers dug deeper, more oak platforms were discovered at depths of 12 meters, 15 meters, and 18 meters, with the addition of coconut fiber and putty. At 21.3 meters, they hit a platform of plain oak, followed by more oak but sealed with putty at 24.4 meters. At 27 meters, a stone not native to Nova Scotia was recovered bearing an inscription. They believed they were about to recover a hoard of pirate's treasure. Sadly, the significance of the cipher on this stone was lost on Smith and the other treasure hunters, as Smith, who owned the island at the time, fitted the stone in his fireplace. The inscription was translated to read, 40 feet below, 2 million pounds are buried. Believing the pirate treasure to lie beneath the mysterious stone, it was hastily removed from the pit to uncover another layer of wood, rather than the bounty of treasure the prospectors believed would surely lie beneath. As nightfall descended, the party gave up due to poor visibility and water becoming an increasing problem. All digging was aborted until daylight, as it was thought the pirate riches could wait one more night in the ground, having been buried for a number of years there already. They must have left the island with thoughts of pirates and vast treasures filling their minds. Sunday being the next day, no work took place on the pit due to religious commitments. The group returned to Oak Island on Monday, eager to recover the treasure, only to find the shaft flooded with seawater all but 10 meters from the surface. All excavation attempts to pump and bail out water failed, resulting in the pit containing water at a consistent level of 10 meters from the top. Digging became impossible in this situation, and the project was abandoned for one year. All the workers returned to their farms and looked forward to continuing their search in the springtime. It was decided that a separate treasure shaft be dug next to the original, in order to allow the flood water to pass into this new chamber. At a depth of 33 meters, 
the original shaft was tunnelled into but to no avail. The diggers were lucky to escape with their lives, as the walls of the new shaft caved in, leaving the original shaft flooded up to a level of 10 metres below the surface again. Smith began to despair believing he'd been beaten by nature. He gave up accepting the treasure to be out of their grasp, a feeling many were to experience in the future, even with the use of metal detectors and radar. The Solar and Heliospheric Observatory is a satellite that keeps an eye on the Sun's activity. It's a joint mission between NASA and the European Space Agency and has been operational for more than 20 years. While watching the Sun's activity, the satellites produce some interesting discoveries about how the Sun works. According to ESA, its discoveries include finding complicated gas currents below the Sun's visible surface, as well as tracking frequent changes in magnetic fields. Researchers came close to losing the spacecraft in June 1998, less than three years after launch. The satellite was in the wrong position to receive communications from Earth, and was not responding to commands. The Solar and Heliospheric Observatory was designed to study the internal structure of the Sun, its extensive outer atmosphere and the origin of the solar wind. But over the years it's also picked up on some strange anomalies. YouTube UFO channel Mahonzen74 claims various types of UFOs are orbiting the Sun. UFO enthusiasts believe this image shows a genuine UFO hovering around the Sun and some going as far as saying these crafts use the sun to refuel. One issue that arises with these objects is their size. Some of the alleged crafts that are being witnessed are as big as the moon, with some being even bigger than that. If these crafts are alien in nature, how do they withstand the temperature of the sun? At the core of the sun, gravitational attraction produces immense pressure and temperature, which can reach more than 27 million degrees Fahrenheit. Hydrogen atoms get compressed and fused together, creating helium. This process is called nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion produces huge amounts of energy. The energy radiates outwards to the sun's surface, atmosphere and beyond. From the core, energy moves to the radiative zone, where it bounces around for up to one million years before moving to the connective zone, the upper layer of the sun's interior. The temperature here drops below 3.5 million degrees Fahrenheit, Large bubbles of hot plasma form a soup of ionized atoms and move upwards to the photosphere. The temperature in the photosphere is about 10,000 degrees. It's here that the sun's radiation is detected as visible light. Sunspots in the photosphere are cooler and darker than the surrounding area. At the center of big sunspots, the temperature can be as low as 7,300 degrees. Most scientists believe the UFOs and other dots and shapes appearing around the Sun are just part of the huge release of electrons, ions and atoms during the flares and mass ejection that often follows. Unidentified flying object is the popular term for any aerial phenomenon whose cause cannot be easily or immediately identified. Both military and civilian research shows that a significant majority of UFO sightings have been identified after further investigation. Typically, most sightings turn out to be either stars, planets, advertising planes, optical illusions and hoaxes. Skeptics argue that the remainder of the reports could probably be explained if additional information were available. In the last 30 years or so, the triangle shape has become a topic of much discussion. Often reported as flying low and running silent with several lights on the bottom. Sightings of these objects often comes in waves and they are reported as being able to go from a crawl to a high-speed departure in a matter of seconds. Many feel that the Triangle UFO may be a top-secret government craft, still in the experimental stage and more than likely designed with military implications. Some researchers feel that the next step in the stealth series of craft, capable of flying low and making their exits without being detected by enemy radar. This type of craft would be indispensable for enemy surveillance, especially with weapon capabilities. Although the Triangle Craft seems to be a dark, mysterious entity, according to researcher and author Clyde Lewis, Triangle sightings in the UK are almost an everyday occurrence. He states in his article, There have been approximately 4,000 reports of Triangle since 1990 in the UK alone. There have also been waves of Triangle sightings in Belgium, France, Holland and Germany. On March the 30th, 1993, 
multiple witnesses across southwest and west England saw a large black triangle at low speeds. Analysis of the sighting by Nick Pope concluded that the object moved in a northeasterly course from Cornwall to Shropshire over a period of approximately six hours. The Kenosha UFO wave began in December 2016. The events of the 17th of February were documented by multiple groups of witnesses. All of the reports consist of multiple dark triangular objects in the sky with blinking white and red lights. The craft was also seen on the 19th of January 2017, barely hovering above the ground. The object was described as dark on the bottom with lights and silvery on top. The Phoenix lights were a series of widely sighted unidentified flying objects observed in the skies over Arizona and Nevada in the United States and Sonora, Mexico on Thursday the 13th of March 1997. There were allegedly two distinct events involved in the incident. A triangular formation of lights seen to pass over the state, and a series of stationary lights seen in the Phoenix area. The United States Air Force identified the second group of lights as flares dropped by an A-10 Warthog. That's were on training exercises at the Barry Goldwater Range in southwest Arizona. These flares have a burn time of around 5 minutes, but this contradicts the sighting. The craft was seen for more than 3 hours, so some have questioned how it could have been flares. The governor at the time was one witness to the incident. He later called the object otherworldly. Could this giant object be proof of an underwater pyramid? The structure estimated as being between 3.5 and 10 miles across was spotted on Google Earth in the Pacific Ocean. A video about the discovery uploaded to YouTube has drawn vast speculation about what it could be, including an ancient sunken city, a bizarre UFO or even an alien base. The discovery was made by Argentinian Marcelo Igusta. Using Google Earth, Igusta believes he found a giant pyramid near Mexico. He claims he came across the underwater structure after noticing a bright beam of light within the darkness of the Pacific Ocean. This beam led him to what he believed to be an enormous pyramid, and according to some UFO enthusiasts, a UFO base. The pyramid in question can be found at the coordinates on the screen. Several UFO enthusiasts have come forward supporting the theory, and noted that the 8.5 mile width was a modest estimate, and that it may very well be 11 miles wide at most. Being close to Mexico, some have also said there are similarities between the underwater mystery in the Aztec and Mayan pyramids, adding that no human could have constructed such a structure. Some have also said it could be part of the mythical Atlantis. The mystery of the lost city of Atlantis still captures the imagination of millions. Many books and TV shows have been made about the possible location of Atlantis. A quick Google search will show you that some people say Santanori is Atlantis, while others believe that the waters of Benini are hiding a road to the lost city. However, if we look at Plato's text, it tells us where the submerged island once stood. The text reads that Atlantis came forth out of the Atlantic Ocean. It goes on to say there was an island situated in front of the Straits which are by you, called the Pillars of Heracles. Today we call these the Straits of Gibraltar, where Spain and Africa are separated by a narrow strip of sea. Most of us probably think of a lush green island surrounded by deep blue ocean waters when we picture Atlantis. While the story focuses on the island, most of us probably assume that Atlantis was no more than this, but Plato tells us that Atlantis was actually an empire ruled from this island. While many believe the story is a myth created by Plato to illustrate his theories about politics, others insist it's based on a real historical disaster. His account included detailed descriptions of the island with mountains in the north and along the coast, and a plain in the south. Its kings were descended from Poseidon, the god of the sea, but their divine lineage became diluted as they mixed with mortals. Over the centuries, scholars have attempted to locate the real Atlantis, believing the account was based on a real ancient superpower. Some believe the Atlantis myth was inspired by the Black Sea floods around 5000 BC, an event that may have also generated the flood story which appeared in the Old Testament. Whatever we decide to believe in the legend is our own choice, but there are still many unanswered questions regarding Atlantis. So what do you think these photos show? Let me know your theories in the comments. The Lake Ontario Serpent is a Canadian sea monster. There are many sightings for this creature as well as a local legend. 
ranging from children's stories, settlers' tales, and modern sightings. The one thing that all the sightings have in common is that they tell of a long and serpent-like creature. The creature is known by other names, such as the Metrosaurus and Kingsty, from Kingston and the east side of the lake. The creature or creatures could be inhabiting most of the Great Lakes too. This is because there are some sightings of long eel-like monsters and the lakes are all connected in some way. On July the 3rd, 1817, the crew of a ship witnessed a blackish snake-like monster. The monster was witnessed three miles offshore. On August the 5th, 1829, two children believed they had seen a 20 to 30 foot long snake-like creature. Their account was published in the local newspaper stating, this type of creature has been seen on a few occasions. There can be no doubt of the existence of such monsters in our inland seas. On an unnamed date in 1842, two boys, their both names McConnell, reported seeing a brown 30 to 40 foot creature with a large head swimming off the shore of Gull Beach. They were quite surprised and quickly told their father. He reacted by grabbing his binoculars, but before he could get a good look of the creature, it disappeared back into the devs. On August the 22nd, 1882, a serpent was witnessed in the water near Fort York. Three witnesses described it as being 50 foot long, as white as a man and bluish grey with stiff bristles covering its body. The account was published in the Toronto Mail and then later republished in the New York Times. The creature spent some time floating and basking in the sun before swimming off into the distance. In August of 1877, the creature was spotted in Burlington Bay, where it was described by fishermen as resembling a log with a mouth like a crocodile. Even one fisherman claimed that the monster had snapped off his oar, leaving visible tooth marks. A journalist from Kingston Daily News noted that, we give the story as gathered for what it's worth, and leave the reader to investigate for him or herself. In September 1881, passengers and the crew of the steamship Gypsy got a glimpse of a huge creature. It was described as being 25 to 40 foot and having small legs and a large tail. In July 1892, a couple were attacked by a monster while fishing near Brackey's Bay. The husband fended off the monster with his fishing pole, saving both their lives. The couple described the creature as a huge serpent with eyes like balls of fire. During the 1970s, a creature was sighted twice by the same person. He was an employee of the Ministry of Natural Resources. For both sightings, he said that he saw a large creature dive into the lake from the shores of Prince Edward County. From the outside, number 30 East Drive in Pontefat looks like any other house on the street. It's a modest three-bedroom semi-detached council house. However, it has a sinister side hiding within. A decade before the world-famous Enfield Poltergeist case came to the public attention, another haunting took place in the town of Pontefract. Number 30 East Drive on the Checkerfield Estate, East Yorkshire, stood on a corner at the top of a hill close to what was once the site of the town's gallows. Living at number 30 were Jean and Joe Pritchard, their son Philip aged 15 and their daughter Diane aged 12. The poltergeist, later to become known as the Black Monk of Pontrefact, began disturbing the Pritchard family in 1966 with a wide variety of paranormal activity. Water pools, lights turning on and off, furniture overturning, pictures being slashed, objects flying or levitating. Knocking sounds, objects disappearing and reappearing again, foul smells, farmyard noises, heavy breathing sounds. Sudden drops of temperature and a mysterious black road figure whose appearance became more and more frequent were all reported at the house. The police, a local MP and the vicar were all witness to the extraordinary happenings which continued to plague the household, and all attempts to exercise the presence were unsuccessful and met with mockery. The events began in August 1966 during the August Bank holiday week. The family had gone on holiday to Devon leaving 15-year-old Philip at home with his grandmother Sarah Skulls. While alone in the house, Sarah felt a cold gust of wind despite the warm weather outside. When Philip re-entered the house, he noticed white powder falling from mid-air around the living room. Their assumption was that it was somehow falling from the ceiling. However, the ceiling had only been recently redecorated. At this point, the pair were more confused than scared, so Sarah went to consult her daughter, Marie Kelly, who lived just across the road. When Marie saw the white powder, she went into the kitchen to get a cloth to clean it up, and promptly slipped in a pool of water that formed on the kitchen floor. Numerous puddles of water began appearing on the kitchen floor, 
by now one of the neighbours, Enya Pritchard, came round to see number 30 to see what the commotion was about. Being the practical type, she immediately went and turned off the water. However, it had no difference and pools of water still appeared. Mrs. Kelly then decided to report the water leaks to the water board who advised they would send someone around as soon as possible. Later that afternoon, the man from the water board appeared. After much checking of pipes, rotting the drains and summarising that the water may be condensing, he went away to report the problem to his manager, and an hour later the pool of water stopped appearing. This was only the beginning though. Later that evening at around 7pm, Sarah was watching TV in the living room when from the kitchen Philip shouted, Grandma, it's happening again. The worktop in the kitchen was strewn with sugar and dry tea leaves, and as they stared at it, the button on the tea dispenser went slowly in and out several times covering the draining board in tea. This carried on even when the tea dispenser was empty, prompting Sarah to shout out in desperation, stop it. As she did so, there came a loud crash from the hallway. They slowly opened the door leading to the hallway, half expecting to catch a burglar, only to find it silent, dark and empty until a hall light flicked on by its own accord, startling them both. They slowly made their way to the foot of the stairs and saw what made the noise. A plant which was usually at the foot of the stairs was now halfway up them, missing its pot which was on the landing above. As if this wasn't enough to fray their nerves, another sound rang from the kitchen making them jump once again. On investigation, they saw that a cupboard was vibrating as if someone was inside. As soon as Philip snatched open the door, the vibration stopped, whilst almost immediately another loud banging noise started up somewhere else in the house. Sarah now noticed a sudden chill in the air and decided to fetch Marie Kelly again. As soon as Marie stepped in the kitchen, she was confronted by the shaking cupboard and the sound of cups and plates inside rattling. Sarah then went to the next door to ask the neighbour Mr and Mrs Mountain if they were responsible for the banging noises. Mrs Mountain looked in amazement at Sarah saying, We thought it was you. By the time Sarah returned, the noises stopped. The three of them sat discussing the unnerving events until around 9.30pm. When Marie left hoping it was all over for the night, Philip decided to go to bed and Sarah figured a good night's sleep was needed also. After locking up and switching off the downstairs lights, Sarah went into Philip's room to wish him a good night. As she did so, a heavy chest of drawers began swaying without explanation. That was the final straw for the night. Sarah and Philip left the house and went to sleep at a neighbour's out of fear for their safety. The house continues to attract teams of paranormal investigators from all over Europe, and is featured on many paranormal television shows. In Massachusetts on the night of January the 25th, 1967, one of the most celebrated cases of UFO abductions began. Betty Anderson was in the kitchen while her seven children, mother and father, were in the living room. Shortly after 6.30, the lights in the house briefly blinked. Immediately after, a reddish light began to beam through the kitchen window. The sudden darkness in the house set the kids' nerves on edge, and Betty ran to comfort them. Her father ran into the kitchen to peer out the window and find the source of the unusual light. To his utter shock, he saw five odd-looking beings coming towards the house with a hopping motion. Before he could regain his composure, he saw the beings walk right through the wooden door. The entire family was suddenly put into a state of suspended animation. One of the creatures went to Betty's father while one of the other four began to make telepathic communication with Betty. One of the group seemed to be a leader of sorts. He was about five feet tall. The other four appeared to be about a foot shorter. All of the beings had a pear-shaped head with wide eyes and small ears and noses. Their mouths were only slits and never moved, though they were able to communicate through their minds. The beings wore a top of coverall blue in colour with a wide belt. There was also a logo of a bird on their sleeves. The hands only had three fingers and they wore boots. The creatures did not move as a human but floated as they went. Betty would later relate that though she was frightened, she felt a sense of calm, even friendship towards the beings. The aliens were holding Betty's children in a frozen state of consciousness, but when Betty showed concern for them, the aliens released her 11-year-old daughter to assure her the children were not being harmed. Betty was taken by the aliens outside to a waiting craft which rested on the side of a sloping bank. The craft was estimated to be 20 feet in diameter in the classic UFO shape. Betty believes that after she was aboard the ship, it joined a mother craft, where she underwent a physical examination and also was subjected to the side effects of strange equipment. After this, she was given a type of bizarre test, 
which caused her pain at first but resulted in a kind of religious experience. Approximately four hours later, she was returned to her home by her two captors. When she arrived, her entire family was still in a state of suspended animation. One of the beings had stayed in her house to watch over the other family members. After releasing the family from their trance-like state, the aliens left. Betty would later state that the aliens had hypnotised her not to recall any of her experience until a designated time. She was able to recall only certain things at the time of her experience. The power outage, the red light through the window and the aliens entering the house. Before this bizarre happening, Betty had little or no knowledge of UFO folklore, and being a devoted Christian, she believed the abduction had a religious meaning. It would be later until she began to view the abduction as alien in nature. Eight years later, Betty answered an ad from Dr. Alan Hynek, who was soliciting abduction experiences from the general public. Her letter was dismissed at first because of its unusual details, and it would be January 1977 before her story would be fully investigated. The investigative team assigned to the Anderson case included the following. A solar physicist, an electronics engineer, an aerospace engineer, a telecommunications specialist, and a UFO investigator. The service of a medical doctor trained in psychiatry were also used. Betty's case involved 12 months of investigation. She was given a character reference check, two lie detector tests, a psychiatric review, and an excruciating 14 sessions of regressive hypnosis. The results of this inquiry were startling. Betty, along with her daughter, relived a detailed account of a UFO experience, agreeing on all basic aspects. The results were published in a 528 page account which stated that Betty and her daughter were sane individuals, who sincerely believe all of the details given in their statements. The Betty Anderson abduction case is still being investigated today. The origins of the Tennessee Wildman go way back to the 1800s in Tennessee. One of the stories is that a circus showman somehow captured the beast and put him on display in a cage to where everyone can see him for exploitation until it finally broke free. The description of the Tennessee Wild Man is similar in appearance to the Sasquatch, but only more human. He supposedly has either dark grey or ginger hair, is about 7 feet tall and is always accompanied with piercing red eyes. It's known to spout out a disturbing war cry that can frighten anyone that hears it, and has a horrible smell that's familiar to the skunk ape. It's very aggressive in behaviour and could possibly be the arch enemy of the Sasquatch. Not surprisingly, the Wild Man possesses great strength, agility, and speed. There have been many groups of men that went out hunting for the creature, but at all times usually they don't find anything or something traumatising happens. The monster is known to have a strange targeting obsession with dogs and women. Many women come out and say the Wild Man attempted to snatch them up and carry them away. However, it's suspected that these attempts were always unsuccessful. The latest known Wildman sighting took place about 20 years ago near Tennessee. Rob Phillips along with his cousin were on a night hike to Bee Cliffs. Through the rain they noticed something strange in the forest. Everything had become silent. The sound of a snapping twig broke in the silence, followed by a horrible inhuman scream unlike the hikers have ever heard. The men fled separately through the darkened wood, with Phillips soon finding safety behind a tree. It wasn't long after that that he spotted the wild man clinging to a nearby tree. This was around 15 feet away from Rob. Rob heard his cousin break for the hill and he followed suit. Philip's account corresponded slightly with the initial tales of the Tennessee wild man. He was described as about 9 feet tall with red beady eyes, a set of claws and a horrible stink that Philip's compared to the stench of a dead animal. It's unlikely the Tennessee wild man has lived almost 150 years in the Tennessee mountains it may be assumed that more than one of these creatures exists, or could the creature sighting in the Bee Cliffs area be something else entirely? Resurrection Cemetery is one of the most famous haunted locations in the United States. Unusual and unexplainable phenomena has been reported here as far back as January 1979. With over 152,000 graves, not counting the 5,300 crypts in the mausoleum, it's truly a mammoth burial ground. Area residents have nicknamed it the Resurrection Triangle, due to all the strange events that have taken place here throughout the years. Resurrection was consecrated in 1904, and opened officially in 1912. 
Several motorists have stated they've picked up a hitchhiker only to have the hitchhiker disappear minutes later, almost as if the hitchhiker was a ghost. Richard Crow was a local historian in January 1979. Crow believed the hitchhiker was not a human but a ghost. He said the following, I think that of all the ghost stories worth believing in, Resurrection Mary is the one with the best documentation. The witnesses that I found are remarkably level-headed, and they're primarily middle-class types who have steady jobs and no other major claims to psychic encounters in their lives. The first case was in 1939, when a Chicago cab driver named Jerry Pallas stopped to pick up a female passenger at the front of the gates of the cemetery. He was captivated by the beautiful blonde woman, and immediately asked her out on a date to the local dance hall. He learned her name was Mary and she lived on the south side of town. When it was time to leave, he offered her a ride home, but she instead asked him to drop her off at the cemetery on Archer Road. When she arrived there, she stepped out of his car and vanished before his eyes. He was perplexed at what he just witnessed, and was determined to know more about this mysterious woman. Paulus drove to the house where the mysterious woman said she lived. He was greeted by a mother who looked surprised to see a stranger on her doorstep in the dead of night. He inquired about the mystery woman he danced with just hours before, and it was then that he received the terrible news. Her mother told him her daughter's name was Mary and that she died five years earlier. He then understood why she was ice cold to the touch. Another incident involved two officers who patrolled the area near the cemetery. One night the officers noticed a figure inside the gates of the cemetery and thought someone had accidentally been locked inside. They called the cemetery caretaker and left the area for a brief moment, but returned to no figure inside the gate or anywhere in the area. At the gate where she stood just minutes earlier, there were imprints of two small hands. People are still witnessing Mary to this day. The Quimbaya were a pre-Columbian culture living in South America from 300 to 1550 CE. They were very well known for their incredible skills in very precise gold and metal work. Among the figurines discovered, some models actually resemble what some believe could be flying machines. The Quimbaya airplanes are golden artifacts found in Colombia and made by the Quimbaya civilization. What makes these airplane models so amazing is they are aerodynamically accurate. In 1994, German aeronautical engineers Peter Belting and Konrad Labers created larger scale radio controlled models of these artifacts. They proved the designs fly with single propeller power and jet power. The astonishing reality of these artifacts sets in when one considers that mechanical flights had not been invented until 1903. How then could the pre-Columbians of 1000 BC understand the advanced concepts of aerodynamic lift and design? Modern researchers have mixed beliefs about the Quimbaya civilization and their presumed knowledge of flight based on gold artifacts. There are arguments regarding this theory over the lack of building materials necessary to make flying machines hundreds of years ago, along with the absence of modern engines, and that landing strips for the golden flyers have not been discovered. It's entirely possible for artifacts to be moved around from place to place in the ancient world, especially if they fell victim to more dominant people, or the cultures migrated for survival over time. The artifacts do exist, and they might help clarify another interesting ancient phenomenon not too far from where the Quimbaya once lived. Certain parts of the Nazca lines are believed by some researchers to resemble ancient runways. Quimbaya golden artworks were often buried with the dead as tokens necessary for prosperity in the afterlife. Examining the cache of available artifacts, it becomes evident that Quimbaya created artworks based on interpretations of real objects and people. The golden airplanes could be evidence of an ancient culture's knowledge of flight well before modern times, or they could represent an extinct species of insects. There is also an alternative concept to consider with artifacts such as the golden flyer, be it through cultural influence from the outside civilization. Today we find an intriguing phenomenon which takes place after a remote culture is visited for the first time with modern technology. Isolated tribes visited in both Africa and South America by airplanes have both demonstrated shifts in religious beliefs after the visit. One of the tribes welcomed the plane on its second visit with ceremonial fire, and statues constructed in the shape of airplanes. Tribes people even went so far as to land themselves along a runway path to greet the visitors. 
If remote cultures exhibit this sort of behaviour during the world's modern technological era, then likely the same concept has played out before. From this angle of thinking, theories then suggest the Quinn Bear may have been influenced by another ancient culture, or perhaps some sort of alien civilization. Nibiru believers are convinced the rogue system is making its way from the outer solar system inwards, where it will wreak havoc on Earth as it passes at about 4 million miles away. They say the planet will cause the poles to switch, sparking great earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. But a series of false arrival dates have come and gone, with conspiracy theorists claiming it will be later this year. Now, photos and videos have surfaced online that some claim could show the mythical planetary system appearing behind the sun. In the clip, the narrator explains how he used a drone fitted with a polarised lens to uncover the phenomenon. The camera pans round and we see the sun glowing bright in the distance, but as the filter darkens, two objects appear alongside. The man claims one of them is apparently Nibiru and it's getting closer, alongside another planet from the legendary mini-star system. Many don't believe the planet exists and state it's just another conspiracy theory. Predictions have been made for when this planet is meant to collide with the Earth, but it never seems to happen. NASA has also said this about the planet. The story started with claims that Nibiru, a supposed planet discovered by the Sumerians, is headed towards Earth. This catastrophe was initially predicted for May 2003, but when nothing happened the doomsday date was moved forward to December 2012, and linked to the end of one of the cycles in the ancient main calendar at the winter solstice in 2012. Hence the predicted doomsday date of December the 21st, 2012. There are no planetary alignments in the next few decades, and even if these alignments were to occur, their effects on the Earth would be insignificant. For example, one major alignment occurred in 1962, and two others happened during 1982 and 2000. Each December, the Earth and the Sun align with the approximate centre of the Milky Way galaxy, but that's an annual event with no consequence. Nibiru and other stories about wayward planets are an internet hoax. There is no factual basis for these claims. If Nibiru or Planet X were real and headed for an encounter with the Earth in 2012, astronomers would have been tracking it for at least the past decade, and it would have been visible by now to the naked eye. Obviously, it does not exist. Eris is real, but it's a dwarf planet similar to Pluto that remains in the outer solar system. The closest it can come to Earth is about 4 billion miles. Once again, theories have claimed this planet will show itself later this year. But what do you guys think? Is Planet X real or just another conspiracy theory? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Aliens, government conspiracies, meteorites, missile explosions or even a prank? These are some of the ideas buzzing around the discovery of a giant crater in Russia. The first crater lies on the northern tip of the Yamal Peninsula. The term Yamal means end of the world in the local language. It was an unstable place to explore or even approach too closely, with its rims melting and falling inside and the sound of water running deep within. The marshy state of the hole meant scientists had to wait until winter, when the crater had frozen solid to determine what was inside. The second crater in Yamal is assumed to have formed in September 2013, with witnesses confident it was a meteorite. There were no witnesses to the formation of the third crater which was found by shepherds who nearly fell inside. The first Yamal crater was initially inspected by helicopter and soil, water and air samples were taken near the opening of the surface. There were a variety of explanations thrown around of how these massive holes came to be, from a meteorite impact to weapons testing to aliens taking soil samples. Investigation found these holes were not man-made and were not consistent with meteorite impact. The most logical explanation relied on the fact that these craters form near large methane reserves. This region has been clobbered by climate change in the past few years of the warmest there have been in 120,000 years. It's possible that a pocket of gas in the soil became heated and started building pressure. With the ground thawed more than usual, the gas was able to push through the surface, popping like a cork. This phenomenon is known as a pingo. Once the researchers have a better understanding of the crater's composition and a model for how it formed, they'll be able to go and investigate more recent craters. They then plan to examine satellite data from the last 30 years in hopes of finding other similar structures to study. 
people are also finding deep holes in Russian forests. They appear in the dense forest where there is no easy access for a car, truck, heavy digging equipment or even people. Plus there is no soil nearby, which tells some people the hole wasn't dug. According to Slightly Walked, when people are brave enough to venture into the holes they find they end abruptly in the darkness. There is no reasonable ideas on how these holes appear and what they are being used for. No one knows who or what to dig in these holes or why. It's not always archaeologists who make the greatest discoveries. Sometimes it's regular people going about their business who stumble upon incredible finds. Reddit user Tram Stop Dan found a homemade wooden box in a dumpster. On the face of things the box didn't look very unusual. It had hinges, a handle and a pair of locks. But that all changed when he opened it and discovered stacks of papers featuring diary entries about flying saucer visits in the late 1960s to 1980, plus a whole bunch of other interesting stuff like drawings of biblical creatures. That's pretty odd but things get odder, and this is why the box was called the Box of Crazy. He discovered sketches of UFOs and heavenly four-headed entities appearing to be from the biblical book of Ezekiel, plus creatures with wings and other drawings that blended the divine and extraterrestrial. However the contents of the box didn't just stop at aliens, because Tram Stop Dan then found some non patented drawings of train wheels, and hand drawn maps from the late 1930s, which were all marked with a pinhole in the center. When these mind blowing sketches, writings and map were shown on reddit, the internet immediately started asking questions. Why were they placed in a box and shoved in a dumpster? Did their artist witness another dimension, or are they just the ramblings and rantings of an open minded person? One thing that is strange is that the drawings are definitely not amateur. Just by looking at them you can tell time and thought went into these. The drawings also suggest the artist saw something in Tampa Florida in 1977 that changed him. The artist was able to sketch the alleged event as they witnessed it, and as stated it includes UFOs and strange looking entities. Some have suggested this is evidence of a divine encounter, while others have labelled it as a hoax. But what do you guys think? Are these sketches proof of a mysterious encounter, or just another well thought through hoax? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe for more videos.